The Week in Art is sponsored by Christie's. Visit christies.com to find out more about the world's leading auction house since 1766. Auction, private sales, online, art, anytime. Hello and welcome to The Week in Art. I'm Ben Luke. This week, Naomi Beckwith and Okwi Ogpokwasili on a major show at the New Museum in New York, the final project curated by Okwi Enwazel. As well as looking at grief and grievance at the new museum, we explore the effect of COVID-19 on artists with disabilities. We talk to an artist and representatives of the UK charity Outside In. And in this week's Work of the Week, we talk to the Goya specialist Francisco Chaparro about one of the prints in Goya's Disasters of War series. Before all that, a reminder that you can sign up to the Art Newspaper's free daily newsletter for all the latest stories. Go to theartnewspaper.com and the newsletter link is at the top right of the page. And while you're there, you can also sign up for a range of other newsletters. Now, the new museum in New York this week opened Grief and Grievance, Art and Mourning in America, an exhibition originally conceived for the museum by the hugely influential curator Okwi Mwazor before he died in 2019. Grief and Grievance features 37 artists who address the theme of mourning, commemoration and loss in response to the racist violence experienced by African-American communities. The title, the museum says, refers to, quote, the intertwined phenomena of black grief and a politically orchestrated white grievance as each structures and defines contemporary American social and political life. A curatorial advisory group has worked together to realise and interpret in Wazel's vision. Massimiliano Gioni of the New Museum, the artist Glenn Ligon, in Wazel's regular curatorial collaborator Mark Nash and Naomi Beckwith, senior curator at the Museum of Contemporary Art in Chicago, who's just been appointed chief curator of the Guggenheim Museum in New York. Our editor in the Americas, Helen Stoilus, spoke to Beckwith about the exhibition. I wondered, what's it been like bringing this show to its final stages, making sure that Oakley's incredible vision has been realized? What was your thinking through the process to make sure you got to this kind of final end stage? Oakley had a febrile mind. There were always so many things that he was thinking about and working on, and he could have an idea a decade ago that manifests itself into a show much, much later. And, And so his ability to kind of hold uh, and juggle things uh, intellectually and mentally that then get realized later was uncanny, honestly. The more that I read essays of his from about 10 years ago, I realized the core of some of this thinking was already there, especially the core of of ideas in grief and grievance. So all that is to say that this actually is unlikely to be Oakley's last show believe it or not, there'll be more coming, more things to watch and see. The man's ambitions were amazing and so large they will extend and they do extend far past his life. Um, But in terms of grief and grievance, it started as a lecture series for Harvard. And, you know, Oakley is a curator. He thinks through art. Oakley was a curator. It's interesting that I'm still speaking about him in present tense. And so he thinks through art. And he started then to take these ideas uh, that he'd been mulling over, these ideas around what really are the kind of core conditions of American race relations. Where did they begin, what catalyzed them, and what are the ramifications of that core? Um, This sense of black loss and a sense of white grievance that really in his mind got catalyzed around the Civil War. What are those ramifications for the American polity right now? Our process as curatorial advisors, which is what we've been calling ourselves, has really been about trying to round out Oakley's vision where it was necessary. Oakley already had a rather set schematic for the show. He had core objects that he was interested in working with, a painting, a kind of assemblage painting by Daniel LaRue Johnson, another assemblage painting by uh, Jack Whitten, and a, a painting by Jean-Michel Basquiat. He was really interested in these three objects as the ways to anchor a way of of both thinking through reactions to uh, black injustice, but also uh, aesthetic forms that moved between abstraction and figuration. 
between forms that are legible and gestures that deal mostly, I think, with the monochromatic. So these being the kind of catalyzing ideas for the show uh, were great signposts for us to then begin to work with those themes and ideas for the rest of the checklist. It's also the case that Oakley had a fairly extensive artist list there as well. And so again, there were times where he had an object in mind for the artist, and that was great. (laughs) We could ask for that. Um, And mind you, basically no one said no to anything on the checklist. People really wanted to support this project. Secondly, he may have had an artist, but not an object in mind. And so it was up to us as the advisors to really work with these artists and find the right work. And again, artists were super excited to be part of this project and jumped right in with ideas that we could back and forth against each other. And then there were a couple of places where we thought, okay, this artist, especially younger artists, um, may be appropriate for the ideas that Okui's investigating right now, especially given his interest in those objects that were uh, less directly representational of grief, but really more oblique in thinking about the conditions that lead to grief. And this is where, you know, Glenn's voice was really important for Okui uh, even before he passed and continued to be important for the process as we planned the exhibition. That's that's incredible. And you mentioned some of these works that kind of signpost um, the exhibition. I was hoping we could talk about them as well. Jack Witten's Birmingham is this incredible, I mean, it feels like a shot in the stomach, right? Yes, yes. With aluminum foil tearing away from the canvas and there's, um, there's cardboard and drawing underneath, painted black. Um, Daniel LaRue Johnson's Freedom Now, number one, is this assemblage again of found objects, including a Freedom Now pin, and the entire thing is covered in pitch. Yes. Like tar pitch, right? Yes. And then um, Jean-Michel Basquiat's Procession, um, which is almost the schoolyard um, parade of figures with one leading them bearing a skull kind of up in the air. What was it about these works that you really think kind of hold the the whole the whole show together? You know, what is it that they kind of communicate? They're all incredibly and equally powerful work. And, you know, starting a bit with the Basquiat, um, the Basquiat is probably the most figurative one of Mm. it. I love the way you describe it as kind of a schoolyard taunt, these kind of ghostly figures. They're really, you know, they're figures in shadow, totally in shadow, four figures. Actually, probably for Jean-Michel Basquiat, one of the more naturally rendered figures we've ever seen, you know, clearly a person of color who is trying to keep an object away the way you know kids go after the ball and someone's holding it like too high out of their reach that's exactly what's happening in this work except instead of a ball there's a skull you know this figure is holding death but I also am really interested in the way those figures as naive as they are really are representing basically figures of policemen you know, this was a work that's thinking about brutality and made in the wake of police brutality. And we cannot underscore how prescient this work is, um, how prescient even the show is, especially um, after given the events of last year, where the world, the entire world was mobilized at last by police brutality. But what obviously Basquiat's work shows is that this has been an ongoing issue for black and brown communities for decades, even centuries, right? This is nothing new. There was nothing prophetic about this show. In Oak, we also realized the the long-standing issue of state-sponsored violence, essentially, and the like real fear that one undergoes as a Black person in the public sphere, that you may not be protected and, and run a high risk of actually being killed by the state. For Daniel LaRue Johnson and Jack Whitten, both works, I think, uh, enact a very similar gesture. You are right that they are both massive expanses of of black form, black gesture. In the case of LaRue Johnson, really covered in pitch. In the case of Jack Whitten, a kind of really Tashist, um, a Tashist way of dealing with paint on a black surface. They're both, you know, the great American tradition of monochrome painting. But under both of them, there's this kind of hidden form, a a secret object under what is, again, that great monochrome American tradition of painting. And for LaRue Johnson, it goes to A, 
the practice of assemblage, that there is no object that is just going to be comprised of one thing like paint, but that you can put a whole history of things and a whole heap of objects um, into a thing, uh, into an artwork that gives it a sense of history, gives it a sense of connection to social life and the real life. And there, I love that, you know, two of the main objects are this Freedom Now button, you know, that's legible, you know, it's covered in pitch, but, it, you know, just a thin enough veil so that you can read this demand. But next to it is a hacksaw. And there is something so metaphorical, right? And a <laughs> um, mousetrap too, right? Exactly, right? That there is something both maybe hackneyed and entangling about the ways in which we have undergone uh, some of our fights for freedom now that, you know, they weren't getting to the places that we needed at the time. I'm really interested in the multiple layers of metaphors in the Jack Witten work as well, because, uh, you know, Witten was another art artist um, deeply invested in his southern roots, deeply invested in the fact that he grew up right outside of Birmingham, Alabama, which was, a, you know, a mining a metal processing town. One of the biggest products of the town he's from, Bessner, Alabama, was aluminum foil. Aluminum, right? Oh, I didn't know that. Aluminum, yeah, aluminum wow. processing. So uh, Jack Witness created this painting that on the surface is all black, but as you rightly say, it looks like it's been shot through and violently opened and excised. And that right under that element of paint is aluminum, right? A kind of metaphor for what Birmingham produces. And underneath that, you have a clipping from a newspaper or a magazine. It's basically... Um, a very famous uh, scene shot by Charles Moore in 1963, one of the protests in Birmingham, Alabama, where the police are very casually sicking dogs on protesters. I mean, and it's really interesting. You see this in their stands. You know, the dogs are like jumping at folks, biting at folks, tearing their clothes, ripping their bodies. And the police are so relaxed in posture. It is eerie, the presaging of the George Floyd moment. But you also have seen this image before in other work. So famously, Warhol used it for his race riot series, right? He used that same photo shoot. And so you have Warhol kind of taking this image, repeating it over and over again, kind of making banal, as Warhol is wont to do, the register of American trauma, bringing it to the surface, but also talking about his banality in, in very effective ways. And Witten actually then doing a kind of black interpretation, an African-American interpretation of that, of saying that for his personal practice as an artist, as someone committed to the forms of abstraction, there is always that sense of knowingness and trauma at the basis of his work. It is never going to be purely about making marks. It also is going to be about history and fear. And there's there's some more contemporary works as well. These are kind of historic works. Um, Jack Witten and mm -hmm. LaRue Johnson's pieces from 1963, 64, and then Basquiat's from 86. But the show opens up with Nari Ward's Peacekeeper, right? Yeah. Incredible hearse sculpture. Mm -hmm. There's Arthur Jaffa's now kind of iconic Love is the Message, the Message is Love video piece that's just, you know, for anyone who hasn't seen it, you need to see it. Yes. <laughs> There's Theaster Gates Gone or the Days of Shelter and Martyr that was shown at the Venice Biennale. How, how did these kind of more contemporary works, how did you kind of find these more contemporary works? What was the thinking in, in including them? Mm -hmm. You know, you mentioned that Oakwe kind of had a, had a list. How many of these more contemporary works were Oakwe's inclusion? How much did you have involvement in, in selecting them? Of the ones you just mentioned, Neri, the Aster, uh, Arthur Jaffa, they were all originally on Oakley's list. And, and I mean, that's a testament also to these are artists that he'd been working with over the years. The Aster was in Oakley's Venice. A conversation around Neri's work, which he, he um, which Oakley had been writing about. A conversation with Massimiliano is really what opened up the possibility even of the show Grief and Grievance. Mm. Um, so Neri was already on Oakley's mind as he was creating this. I mean, plenty others were already on the list. Um, you're right. Carrie James Marshall is another one that's really iconic. He's always been thinking about Lorna's work, uh, Carrie Mae Weems' work. So there, um, there's a whole group of artists that, um, that Oakley already had on the list because this was always meant to be a contemporary art show. 
it had these more what we would call historic anchors that works in the 60s and the 80s, but really he wanted to think about practice now. Mm. It's really um, going toward the even younger <laughs> sort of artist list where we were able to make more interventions, really uh, thinking about adding words by Khalil Joseph, you know, knowing Okui's interest in Arthur Japheth's work. Then Khalil Joseph is another artist who is a really interesting way to think about moving image and music as part of the conversation Okui introduced to the show already. Bringing in someone like Dina Lawson, understanding Okui's long engagement with photography, and especially working with a photography that isn't documentary, but seems to be, that kind of crosses the line between a kind of evidence, but also fiction. Julia Phillips was another really interesting artist that we all thought would be an amazing addition to the checklist. Though Okui, he knew of her work, didn't know it well, but she's an artist who really thinks about um, what it means to be embodied and embodied under duress. Uh, and so we thought this would be an incredible addition there. So those were our additions. But I think there were some, some other key guiding principles as well, not just in terms of objects for Okui in the show, but there were maybe sort of a few other things that were really important. And one is Okui's longstanding engagement in general with photography. There's no way that the show couldn't have a kind of heavy presence of that. But again, it's a photography that believes in obliqueness, not a photography that believes in the modernist idea of, of, of evidence and documentary practice, but really photography as questioning evidence and questioning history. And this is what the work of Dawood Bey and Kerry May Weems does. Another really important motivating um, principle was Okui's engagement with um, abstraction, you know, what we would call abstraction now. But really, I think it was a question of Okui uh, always being sensitive to and trying to move away from spectacle. He wasn't interested in artwork just illustrating ideas. That's way too easy. He was really interested in the way artists embody ideas and can embody feelings like grief and mourning and how those things can be articulated or what he called crystallized into forms. I think another thing that was really important, speaking of embodiment, was moving outside of just traditional visual arts practice, you know, really getting to the sonic. There's music on the checklist. Uh, we have this work, Pillars, uh, playing. That is a work by Taishan Suri, a composer and musician. And that was already on Okui's list. He didn't know the work, but he knew this, this is Nan Taishan. He'd be interested <laughs> to have the show. Absolutely. Wow. Absolutely. I've been a fan for years. Absolutely. Um, so, yeah, Okui, again, in his capacious and expansive way, has always been thinking about other disciplines and other forms, even beyond, um, beyond visual art, that can help. Um, really articulate where he is. And that's where, of course, you get the amazing introduction, too, of Okui Akpak Wasili. You know, we were all really not trying to speak in Okui's voice, but, you know, really got a sense of Okui's voice and ideas and planning this exhibition. So it wasn't hard. It wasn't hard to follow the logic. And the show was meant to open up around the U.S. election last year as kind of a rebuke to the racist and dehumanizing policies of former President Donald Trump. Even with him now out of office, the kind of work of rehabilitating the country, it's just starting. So Ooh, how, yes. <laughs> how, how do you think this kind of new context we're in changes things, does it? How does the situation we're in now change how we see the show? Is it kind of a primary stepping stone or is it part of the process? You know, Helen, I wonder... I wonder if Oakley would think this is a new process mm. or a new state. Again, um, early on in uh, planning for the exhibition, I kept asking myself, how did Oakley see this coming? You know, why is it that this show is so relevant? Why does it feel like he could have anticipated exactly the year 2020, even though he was already gone? And I think the answer is he didn't. What Okui understood better than anyone is that these have been long historical issues. So there's a really cynical read, which is to say, or maybe a pessimistic read, I don't know, which is to say, this is nothing new at all. And so in many ways, the show will be ever relevant, sadly, but truly ever relevant. 
But I also do think there is something productive that comes out of this ever-presentness of black grief and white grievance, and that is Okwe, I believe, is trying to shift the terms of the conversations that we've been having around race relations. So that you'll notice that in the title of the show itself, you know, grief, uh, mourning appears, and these aren't political terms. These are psychological terms. These are terms about affect and feeling. And I think that Oakley's trying to say that maybe instead of just having a conversation about justice and freedom and reparations, which are still important things to do and where the state and the individual can be active and activated, I think he's trying to have a conversation about what is really the psyche of America and what can we start literally analyzing about this, this psychological state, which sometimes manifests itself as a psychotic state. Thank you so much for taking the time today to talk with me. You're so welcome. Now, among the 37 artists in Grief and Grievance is the choreographer and performance artist Okwi Okpokwasili, whose performances, often staged in sets designed by her husband and collaborator, Peter Bourne, draw on stories of African and African-American women that have long been ignored or made invisible. Helen Stoilus spoke to her about her contribution to Grief and Grievance, and that's Okwi's daughter you can hear in the background. Your work is very much about this kind of, you know, creation out of destruction in a way or, or erasure. It's your 2017 work, Poor People's TV Remote, that's in the show. And it involves um, this built structure in which performers dance. And it's a collaboration with your husband, right? It's just, I started to think about these movements that are led by women, right? Uh, the incredible energy, tenacity, and, and also a sense of it's coming from love. You know what I mean? Like it's coming from like a fierce kind of love. Uh, this recognition that we need to do something to stop our death. We cannot abide by any more death. And I feel like so, to see it in Nigeria too, I thought, you know, what is it about women and women's movements that have been so powerful and have been charging liberation movements uh, for centuries? I started to think about Bring Back Our Girls because I felt that there was an erasure of the voice of African women that were really bringing that movement to the forefront. And I just started to think about how we're always thinking of saving these women in the global South um, when they've actually been saving themselves and advocating for themselves. So I just started to think about my lack of understanding and even the understanding that my parents don't have, people who grew up whose mothers and aunts may have been a part of these movements or understood or known about these movements. It goes a little further back as well. I mean, these more recent movements, um, Black Lives Matter and the Bring Back Our Girls, you know, these are in the last 10 years. But your piece also references something going back to 1929, the women's war in Nigeria and this kind of collective action that Nigerian women took against the, the colonial kind of powers that had disenfranchised them, then started taxing them. Right, there was a threat of taxation or the women thought that there was gonna be a threat of taxation, but actually the British colonial government said we were never going to do that. We just wanted to count you. Mm. And, and, and I think that men had been counted and they were taxed. So women were like, oh, they're going to start counting us, which means they're going to tax us. But there was also that sense of people shouldn't be counted, right? And this is in the, the Southeast, but there were some who believed that to be counted is almost to sort of to trumpet your numbers before the gods, right? And to count yourself, either you could be called or it's also to reduce you to the status of animal because you count your goats, you count your chickens, right. you don't count people, right? So even the nature of counting was a kind of offense. And their action took this form known as sitting on a man. Is that right? So they would sit. Some of the, so, yes, among one of the actions was, it's interesting because you know the British colonial power had this interesting thing like indirect rule. Right. So they actually tried not to be so present. They had their colonial offices, their imperial offices. But then the people in the villages, they would pick people and they would make them chiefs and they would um, task them with carrying out the British law. And 
getting those taxes and getting those numbers to, to the Brits who could in some way stay, stand in the back, rule from the background, right? So the women were actually protesting uh, directly. They were protesting the native, like native representatives of the British government and sitting on a man was one act where they would go to this person who held this power, right? This native indigenous person who held this power from the British government. And they would go into their private space, their compound, and they would stay there and perform and sing the depredations of that person and require and demand that that person say that they were going to, I am sorry, I will, change my ways, these are the things that I will do to stop this offense, and then the women would leave. And it would be durational. It could go on for at least 24 hours. And what was interesting too was that considering there was this man who held some power and the women would be in their private space, you know, singing and demanding this redress and nobody would do anything. Everybody, like nobody comes in, there are no police officers, there are no other members of elders or other, you know, people with power who would come and do anything. Everyone understood that this is between the women and this, this man. I read it was also kind of seen as the man had brought this upon himself. Yes, that's right. And so it's really powerful to think that the society, particularly in the Southeast of the Igbo society, there was a space where it was recognized that when women had a grievance, you had to leave space for them to express that grievance, right? That it comes from a true place. You know, it wasn't blaming the victims. It wasn't this sense of like, well, those women, how could they know? They don't know what they're talking about. No, it was a sense of to get them to do this action, you must have done something so egregious that you must address it with them. And it's only you who can address it with them. Nobody else can intercede, right? So that space that was inherent in some way to that society for women to collectively speak that grievance, I think is really instructive and interesting. So, th so they were sitting on a man, but then there was also um, the action of women who were of marriage age and older. If they would bear their breasts in public, you would understand that they were deeply aggrieved, right? If your own mother showed you her breasts in public, the shame is on you that you have brought her to that position where she must, she is so aggrieved that she has to bare her breasts. Because even though younger girls would have their breasts bared, mm. that was normal. But once you were married or older, then you were covered. But when you uncovered yourself like that in public, it spoke to some deep distress that you have caused these women. Yeah. And, and, and you know, so, so I was also thinking about that. And then, but the woman's war is referred to sometimes too as the Grand Egwu. Yeah. Right? And egwu means dance. And there was, a, so to me also linguistically and in the language to think that dance is linguistically tied to protest also is instructive, right? And so we understand protest and performance as an, an acting of presence and, you know, taking space, becoming present, speaking, embodied protest as that kind of like sort of the making of a social self you know, a social self that needs to address something. It needs to be seen. Well, thank you so much, Okui. This has been wonderful. Ellen, thank you. Grief and Grievance, Art and Mourning in America is at the New Museum in New York until the 6th of June. Coming up, we hear about artists with disabilities amid the COVID-19 pandemic, and a Francisco Goya print is our work of the week. But first, here are some of the top stories on the art newspaper's website this week. The National Gallery in London has revealed plans for a £25 to £30 million pound renovation project. There will be three key elements, upgrading the lobby of its Sainsbury wing, creating a new research centre and improving the outdoor space on the edge of Trafalgar Square. The museum's next task is to hire a design team, an architectural firm and building work is expected to start next year. The work will be partly completed in early 2024 to celebrate the National Gallery's 200th anniversary. Gabriele Finaldi, the gallery's director, is convinced that it's the right time to launch the project, since, he says, we are beginning to see the end of COVID-19. 
The Vatican museums, which reopened to the public on the 1st of February, have been criticised for failing to implement effective social distancing measures by visitors trapped in overcrowded galleries last Saturday. Pictures emerged on social media showing packed exhibition galleries, with some likening the crush to the metro at rush hour. In a statement, the Vatican Museum's director, Barbara Jatta, dismissed the reports of overcrowding. I find the controversy stirred up by some guys quite silly, she said. First they complained that the museum was closed, then, after 88 days of forced closure, they complain when we reopen. Charles Venable, the president of Newfields, which includes the Indianapolis Museum of Art, has resigned after the institution posted and then amended a job listing last month, saying that it was seeking a director who would work to maintain its traditional core white art audience, as well as attract a more diverse one. The decision followed two open letters calling for Venable's removal, including from current and former Newfields employees and more than 2,000 artists. The institution's Board of Governors released a statement leading with an apology. We are sorry. We've made mistakes. We've let you down. We're ashamed of Newfield's leadership and of ourselves. We've ignored, excluded and disappointed members of our community and staff. We pledge to do better. The Board says that it will now hire an independent committee to conduct a thorough review of Newfield's leadership. You can read these stories and more on the website or the app. We'll be back after this. The Week in Art is sponsored by Christie's. Christie's opens its 20th century season with two evening sales on the 1st of March, live streamed from New York and London respectively. A family collection, Works on Paper, Van Gogh to Freud, offers eight exceptional works on paper by the likes of René Magritte, Lucien Freud and Vincent Van Gogh. The modern British art evening sale follows, with highlights including Winston Churchill's Tower of the Ketubia Mosque, alongside works by Henry Moore, Barry Flanagan, John Lavery and Barbara Hepworth. Christie's 20th century auctions continue throughout March, presenting the biggest names in Impressionist, Modern, Post-War and Contemporary Art. Find out more on Christie's.com. Welcome back. Now, stark statistics have emerged revealing that COVID-19 has disproportionately affected the lives of people with disabilities. So what has this past year been like for artists with disabilities and what support is available to them? Outside In is a charity that aims to give a platform to artists facing barriers to the art world due to health, disability, social circumstance or isolation. I spoke to Laura Miles, Communications Manager at Outside In, Hannah Whitlock, the charity's Artist Development Programme Manager, and to Cara McWilliam, an artist working with Outside In. Um, Laura and Hannah, let's begin with you. Um, what is Outside In um, and who does it support? So Outside In is a national charity and we support artists who may face a barrier to the arts world. Kind of trying to reduce that down, it falls mainly under the brackets of health, disability, isolation and social circumstance. But obviously within that there's a plethora of kind of barriers that artists may feel they face individually. Um, As it stands currently we have more than 3,000 artists who have their own galleries on our website. And then we have core programming activities that we provide. So exhibitions, we do a programme of artist development support and also training courses and projects as well. And then we work with partners to do events, bursaries, residencies, projects, co-commissions and have our ambassadors and artist advisory programmes feed back into everything we do to make sure artists are at the heart of everything. Can I ask you, Hannah, from the point of view, I'm really interested in this idea of, of the exclusion from the art world side of things, because this is this seems to me to be absolutely key. It's not about just providing a space. It's about inclusion as opposed to ghettoization, basically. Yeah, and I think if we look at like the model of social disability, I think, you know, the, the art world's made for people that come from a privileged background, that, you know, are cognitive, that are able and um, can access it with no problems. And I think a lot of the artists we work with, um, they just find it incredibly difficult to get somewhere in the art world. So we want to challenge the art world, break down those barriers and, you know, offer a platform for people to show their work and also develop themselves as an artist. Can you give us a flavour of what the pre-COVID programme looked like? Pre-COVID, exhibitions, artist development and training are the kind of programme areas. 
training is our step up training. So we have courses that include interpreting collections. We also have our patient artwork project, which sees artists who have mental health experiences responding to collections of artwork that was created in institutions or asylums and helping the people that might kind of protect that artwork or look after it understand it in a better way. So rather than it being a kind of nondescript number, we have that insight that our artists can impart to those people to help build that work. Um, a lot of our work is with partner organisations, kind of the Welcome Collection, and we're broadening out to do more with Glasgow Museum, Glenside Museum. Um, but it's all about creating opportunities and kind of making sure the artists that we support have the same roles in the art world that they should be able to have kind of under normal circumstances if it was a fairer playing field in the first place. Yeah, pre-COVID, um, a lot of, you know, you know, our vital sort of outreach work are artist support days. And, you know, we're a national charity, so we support artists all over the UK. So we would meet artists in different parts of the, of the country, advertise that we're going to be there to day centres, to community centres, and people could book in a one-to-one -one session with us and we'll go through the process of creating an online gallery on our website. So that's like, you know, showing them how to write an artist statement, take photos of your work, um, document it, measure it, and then they're left with this, you know, great portfolio on the website showcasing their artwork. So that's something we would do a lot. So obviously now, uh, yeah, haven't been able to meet people face to face. Cara, I'd like to turn to you now. Can you tell us a bit about your experience and particularly, you know, under lockdown since the advent of COVID and how it compares in a way to, to what you'd experienced before? Really, in all honesty, my life isn't that vastly different um, in terms of lockdown, as I have been housebound for many years due to ME, which is a highly disabling illness. And what has affected me most emotionally is sadly seeing everyone else around me having to live such a constrained life. Um, and that's hit me really hard on a deep visceral level, as I never wish this on anyone, really. And I'm starting to see the fray and people's difficult emotional states. And I carry a lot of that pain with me due to understanding how it feels to have so much taken away. Um, but then also conversely for me, as everything has gone online all of a sudden, I have so many more artistic opportunities that just weren't there previously. You know, disabled and housebound people have been locked out of so much for so long. And we have asked for things in the past to go online more, but there was so much resistance to it. Um, now, obviously, everyone's in the same situation and I've had to open up and adapt. And really, it just shows how easy it is to do when the able-bodied are affected. And it's quite sad, really, but I think a lot of us are grabbing the opportunities we can presently and hope that we can affect long-term change in opening up our worlds beyond the pandemic. And I hope this ends up being enriching for everyone in terms of inclusivity and considering additional needs when cultural life fully starts up again. It can only be a positive thing for society to have a wide range of voices brought into the artistic conversation. That's a really interesting point that Cara makes there, Hannah, isn't it? Because there has been a levelling effect of the pandemic in the sense that um, beforehand there was very little that was available digitally. Everything was so focused on real world spaces and often inaccessible real world spaces. Is that right? Yeah, I, yeah, I think within the art world, I think something outside in would we would only ever, you know, go to venues which were accessible. We try and make all of our programmes accessible in that way. But we have found that now we are able to engage with a whole different array of artists. Um, for example, um, our engagement with people that are um, visually impaired or blind has increased. I think it's because, um, well, they, they tell me... Um, you know, when they have to travel to events, it's a difficulty going to that venue. They would have to try out that, that journey several times to make sure they'd feel comfortable in doing it. But with the events online, they can just access it straight away. And also those who, yeah, haven't been able to leave their home, um, they can access it from, from home. So it's just been such a positive thing in that respect. Cora, can you say something about how you're showing your work digitally now? I mean, how is your work available to, for people to, to see? So obviously I have a profile on Outside In, which I, I joined during the pandemic, um, so last April. And then I do have an Instagram account. But in all honesty, you know, it's actually very hard for me to have that kind of online presence and to promote myself in that way. 
um, again, due to my disability and my cognition. And for me, my where where you know where my heart is is the artwork. So when I've got to choose between creating or going on Instagram, I'm immediately going to do the creating. So to be honest, a lot of my artwork is sitting right here in my lounge, all piling up. Um, so maybe at some point that will change, and there'll be some way to get other help of of doing you know of, of having that kind of help really. Um, I think a lot of artists with disabilities are probably in a similar situation where we just can't have that. We can't do that side of things. Laura, is that one of the roles that the outside in can do, which is most important in a way, is, is make that there's, you know, there are vast bodies of work available out there. There are lots of artists who are, are simply unable to transmit their work to a wider audience and to different communities. Is that something that, that outside in can, can, can help with? Completely. As um, Hannah mentioned, kind of very much the core and the start of a lot of artists' journey with us is the artist support days, which tend to be run on a one-to-one basis um, with a member of the team. And that includes creating their own galleries online and taking photos of the artwork and kind of the tech support that would be needed for that kind of thing. I think then what that gives everybody is their own their own slice of the internet, their own showcase. You know, it. we're very proud that all of our artists have their own galleries and they are their galleries. You know, we're, we're just happy to host them and share some of the fantastic works that, you know, I'm sure far too many of them are still sitting in lounges unseen. But the fact that they exist and can be celebrated, even if it's a percentage of what exists, is so important. And then we obviously feed that into our exhibitions as well. So we had our national exhibition, which we run every two years. Um, we had that last November. And that really is a showcase and a coming together celebration of what we do and what our artists do. And kind of like, like Cara so well puts it, it kind of brings that out of the lounges and onto the gallery walls that it deserves to be on and in front of the audiences that need to see it. Um, my own journey with Outside In actually started when I was a journalist and I visited an Outside In exhibition and ended up writing a column for the newspaper for it. Um, and that column I attached to my application for this job because it had stuck with me so much that once you, I think once you meet our artists and you hear their stories, they are some of the most inspiring, resilient people you could ever wish to come across. And we can all benefit from that, whether it's during a pandemic or just in everyday life. So we really relish being able to provide that platform and sharing that with other people as well. It's it's integral to what we do. And then the training that we do as well, in, you know, the residencies, it, it is all about celebrating and growing together, really, to make sure that... Um, things are at the levels and being shared and seen that where they should be. And Hannah, we're talking about this idea of creating greater access to, to the art world in general, one of the factors is, of course, not just presenting work, but having it curated. And you, you have programmes where the, where the work is selected for particular exhibitions, right, as well online, for instance. So through our exhibition programme, so we regularly have uh, opportunities where artists can submit work for our exhibitions through their online galleries. And we have a really transparent selection process where we get an array of different judges, perhaps somebody who's an artist. We always have an outside-in artist on there who's exhibited with us before. And then perhaps people from partner organisations that we work with. And it's always important to get a diverse range of people on there so their experience can come into that sort of looking at the artwork and what it means to them. And that's all done on our website. Um, the judges will look at it individually and then all those uh, numbers are then collated and then the top artists will be selected and showcased in the exhibition and it's also important we want to highlight those who didn't get selected so we always have a screen with their artwork on there on a sort of rolling slideshow so people can see those works as well because it's so important to include people as well so yeah we and we have normally their titles and you know on the label 
labels will have their artist name and then the artist will talk about their work in their own words. So it's not curator speak. It is directly coming from the artist, um, how they made their work, what it means to them, any inspiration. I think that also adds another level to the exhibition as well, hearing it in their own artist voice. Cara, tell us more about your experience over the pandemic. You mentioned earlier on that actually it's it's people around you that that have impacted you as much as as much as your own particular circumstances because because for instance there's a lot in the news today about isolation and and the effects of isolation on on people more generally but i wonder um wh- what have your experiences of isolation been in the pandemic yeah um well again sadly for me isolation isn't anything new due to my illness um, and we're a highly disenfranchised and stigmatised group. But it has added on an extra level of isolation. And even though I couldn't get out often previously, the times I could were very special. And it's been hard not to have that contact with other family and friends. Um, I've also had some bad episodes of mental health struggles over the pandemic with an additional trauma diagnosis to deal with. But I have been in art psychotherapy since the summer. And I'd hate to think how badly my mental health would be without the support of my parents and therapists. And then, but once more on the upside, thanks to Outside In, and because of all the new online platforms, I've connected with so many impressive artists this past year who also happen to be really beautiful souls. And I think these are gonna be long-term connections and new dear friends. And that wouldn't have happened for me prior to the pandemic, or it would have taken much longer for me to find fewer people and this has eased my isolation considerably. That's hugely significant, isn't it, Hannah? That it's, that it's a community. It's, it's not just a, a website. It's not just a charity. It's a community of artists. Yeah. And we felt that that's really improved a lot um, just because of digital and this respect that we can reach all artists nationally. So in one of our events, we can have someone from, you know, Scotland, Wales, um, London. They're all there interacting with each other, meeting each other. It, and it's that's been such a positive. Although, you know, there are some artists that we work with that do not have access to digital or the Internet. So, you know, we don't want to forget about those artists and you know that's why phone calls um post our paper newsletter sending things through the post are just yeah are really really important laura i wonder if you can tell us something about what you think the long-term effects on what you can do as a charity are of this period are there both negatives and positives to have emerged from this time in terms of the charity's work um i think there's there's a lot of food for thought for everybody um and as hannah's just mentioned obviously we're aware that we have an offline community anyway and we have kind of provisions in place to make sure they are just as supported as the people that can um, access our online activities. I think going forward we would want to kind of bring the two together in some ways because there is definitely activity that people prefer digitally. Hannah was saying about the visually impaired artists they wouldn't be able to come necessarily to a physical event because they'd have had to do a dry run to make sure they could get there safely and then energy levels for a lot of our artists as well you know being able to attend an event and then knowing you're home already at the end of it that's a game changer for a lot of our artists so we already wanted to have a virtual exhibition a virtual gallery space we've just done that quicker as a result of everything that's happened we've already had we're in our second virtual exhibition at the moment and they've been curated by kind of partners and supporters of the charity and also our courses. So we ran one course last year that might have had nine participants. And this year that course could have 29 participants, you know, and that makes a big change as well. So I think it's kind of continuing the strides we've made forward, but at the same time, making sure our offline work is as strong, is as good as what we're offering online. So we're not creating another barrier you know, when there's enough barriers being faced already. And then I think because this is work we've already been doing with accessibility, we have a role to play to show other people how to do it. You know, we're, we're proud of influencing organisations and saying, you know, look at this work you're missing out on because you've put it in a top room gallery that half our artists wouldn't be able to get to. And that's such a, a shame, I think, the main takeaway for us is we don't particularly want full-on normal to return 
because full on normal wasn't great for a lot of the people that we work with. You know, actually, there's a lot of the new normal that we fully would like to become the future and if not the industry standard as well, because, I mean, we took part in a Russian conference with the Pushkin Museum. And it was fascinating hearing from these organisations around the world what they do, you know, from being able to hire a robot to walk around your exhibition because they realised it's not the same to click through pictures that might be on walls. What you want to do is to be able to go up to the steward in the corner of the room and say, which is your favourite or can you tell me more about this one? And physical limitations shouldn't get in the way of that enjoyment, I think anyone who appreciates art wouldn't want anyone else to miss out on that. So it's a cross-sector thing. There's been a lot of developments this year, but there's still a lot more work to do, I think. Are there practical implications for an expanded audience through the digital provision that you've made? I mean, if, if you are reaching more artists through this digital programming that you've done... Does that have implications in terms of what you can do after the pandemic when when there is more of a capacity for the sort of real world activities? Yeah, like I say, I think our focus is going to be working to bring the two together. You know, we've seen it a lot, you know, how television programmes have evolved where all of their audiences are sitting in their own homes. So, you know, there are things that can be done to bring the two together. And as I mentioned with our ambassador programme and our artist advisory group, Our activity is always led by what our artists need. So if that is what they need, that is our next plan, you know, and it continuing to grow in the way that we have done to this point. And it's been so nice to hear organisations come to us and say, I can't believe you got your events online so quickly and your gallery online, you know, and it's plans to build that. You know, it was quite something being able to attend a Russian conference from my back bedroom, you know, but the principle is still there and that accessibility benefits everybody at the end of the day. Cara, I wanted to ask what, what you've been working on and, and how this may have shifted during this period at all. So a lot of my work is around stigma and understanding my life via abstract art. So, for example, my watercolours revolve around my worlds that I get lost in. And they are the stories and the mythologies and they're my journeys of joy. And the tiny ink marks added on top represent how small, contained and constrained my life is since becoming so affected by ME. And this is an ongoing set of works and I'd love to collaborate with an animator to bring them into a different dimension. So because they have a lot of life and energy and are replete with a wealth of beings and animist spirits. And I can already envision them becoming animated and I'm working on that happening with an upcoming Manchester International Festival event where we all pitch for collaborations. Um, And so much of this is new to me and everything has to be carefully managed as I do need a huge amount of quiet and rest time. Um, Art can only be done in small chunks of time and really I wish I had more capacity, but I'm happy that I can do any art at all. So it's incredibly beneficial to my overall wellbeing. And then another recent ongoing body of work has been around personal traumas and my mental health and their intuitive ink drawings using dip pens. And the shapes represent my different states of mind, but also the variety of mental health conditions. And they talk to the intimate understanding those with lived experience share. And as everyone sees something different in my work, this equates to how we personally perceive ourselves and how others conversely perceive us. So I'm really intrigued to see how this particular body of work progresses in the coming months. And then I have a weekly art studio that I set up with the very wonderful Beth Hopkins, where the art gets in, um, which is a passion project. Um, And it's a drop in. It's a peer led um, space. It's there to be an open space for artists of all walks of life and all different abilities um, to make it as comfortable as possible. And we have a really strong group of artists who attend now Um, and I'd like to work on more collaborations with artists with learning disabilities as well so yeah quite a lot and a a collective we've started um, an art collective which is all outside in artists Um, we met on a talking about art course together we all just connected Um, we fit really really well together Um, and we've got a long-term vision 
to and what we've already achieved for us we're really proud of already um so again all of these things have happened because of the lockdown and pandemic and thanks to outside in Hannah, there is no doubt these this last year has been extraordinarily difficult for lots of people. But at the same time, that's inspirational, isn't it? it what Cara's just saying, there, there is so much being created and you must have witnessed so much of this across your work. Yeah, like it just moves me, you know, when I've when I've got to like travel the UK and meet artists and see their artwork, but not only like what it's done to them, what it's meant for, to them, um, that just blows me away all the time. And yeah, it really does. And to hear what, you know, Cara has been up to. And also it's just, it's it's great to hear about that course, the Talking About Art course um, and how everyone connected together and then they formed a collective and where it's artist led. And that's just what Outside In want to provide, those sort of opportunities where, you know, it's just yeah, the artists leading what they want to do. Um, So yeah, it's really great to hear those things. Well, Cara, Laura and Hannah, thank you so much for talking to us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. If you're an artist or know an artist who would be interested in joining Outside In or work for an organisation which would be keen to work with the charity, please visit outsidein.org.uk or call the UK number 01903 898 171. And finally, it's time for the work of the week. A show of Francisco Goya's prints and drawings has just opened at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. Francisco Chaparro is one of the authors of the exhibition's catalogue, and he's chosen to talk about one of the prints in Goya's series, The Disasters of War, One Can't Look. You can see an image of the work at theartnewspaper.com, click on the podcast tab and look for this episode. Francisco, before we talk about this particular uh, print from the series. Can you just set the scene with the disasters of war? What what are the disasters of war? Disasters of war is a series of prints created by the Spanish artist Francisco Goya between 1810 and 1815 approximately and uh, they are very unique in his production because they reflect his personal response to the Peninsular War and the atrocities he saw uh, in Spain and also because they are a private work. They were not published until much later, so we are seeing here basically Goya talking to himself with the idea of probably publishing this series in the future, but basically it's a private work. Can you say what what, what was the reason that he kept them private? Probably because obviously during the war uh, there were a lot of material scarcities. It wasn't feasible to publish a series like that, like similar to the one like Capriccius he published in uh, 1799. It was very expensive. He didn't have proper materials, which is reflected in the series. Uh, he had to change plates and aquatin was not available. But there was also a, an important reason uh, because the only moment to publish this series was at the end of the war. And uh, people were tired of the war. Um, after the war, came a period of great political repression and also I think because it was not a great moment to emphasize the suffering of the people in the political context of you know popular sovereignty and uh, the restoration of absolutism so it was a combination of factors but it was mostly because people were tired of the war and uh, he decided to move on and create a different series on bullfighting the tauromachia They've become a sort of byword for, for art that depicts atrocities in war. Had any art before that point depicted such atrocities with that level of graphic power? Um, there were some precedents. Uh, the most famous one is obviously Jacques Gallot, uh, a French uh, printmaker in the 17th century. But what makes unique the disasters of war is first the, the historical context, the political context and the philosophical context. Uh, is Goya is certainly the first artist who reflects war from the point of view of the victim and not from the point of view of the king or the, uh, the army or the uh, army. Goya was uh, neutral in this event, even if he was a Spanish and a patriot, but he was a neutral observer from the point of view of um, human rights. Even in a very archaic form, he was aware that it doesn't matter if you are Spanish or you are French, the two sides in the world, uh, you are human. 
and that that's what makes these series unique. There are no great battles, no great panoramic views of battlefields like you find in different um, in the 18th century or 17th century. It's always people suffering. It's about the suffering of the war. And I think in that sense, Goya's work, The Disasters of War, are totally unprecedented. You say he's neutral, so he depicted suffering on both sides. Exactly. He depicted some scenes that uh, can be related to probably to actual events that he saw in the Madrid when he was in Zaragoza and in the in road from Zaragoza to Madrid and other places. And the people, um, it's not very clear, but probably the t- torturing French soldiers or desecrating the bodies of French soldiers. So it's clear that he didn't approve the, those attitudes. And in terms of what we see in these images, I mean, it still today is shocking imagery, isn't it? It's so powerful even now. It is so powerful and it's the disasters of war is one of the reasons why, or maybe even the main reason why Goya is considered to be the first of the modern artists. If you think that he was born in the mid of the 18th century, it's quite shocking because he lived too long and... uh, um, it, it, it's very powerful to us because it's been compared to photography and photojournalism and uh, war reportage. And uh, there are reasons for it. It's just this feeling of immediacy. Um, we feel so close to these figures. Um, there's a visual but also an emotional connection to these figures that is reinforced by the captions. And that's why it looks so modern and so real because it, everything was created the images were built so we feel it, we feel that we are witnessing a real event and uh, this is a real uh, the really modern attitude towards image this idea of immediacy not um, repurposing the objects in the scene to make you feel that you are um, witnessing an artistic creation but the real thing and, and in terms of that sort of real thing, you know, to what extent were they documentary images and to what extent is Goya's famous imagination involved? Because there's works, aren't there, in the series where which are captioned, I saw it and this is how it happened. Exactly. Well, these are not documents. Uh, and that's very important. These are recreations. The important thing is that these are recreations of probably uh, events that could have happened circulated in the news, or maybe Goya read about, or knew they happened. Um, there's one plate in which he wrote, he, the caption is, I saw it, I saw it. And um, there's another um, proof in the MFA Boston collection in which it's written in the back of the, of the, of the impression, uh, Lo de Chinchon, meaning that he probably saw that event in a city near Madrid. Um, so it's it, they are not um, literal transcriptions of things he saw. Even his famous 2nd of May painting is not a literal transcription. But the important thing is that they could be real. And they are, because they are not documentary images, they can be even more powerful and uh, make a, str- a strongest point about um, the events that the images are narrating. That's great. And, and you mentioned the 2nd of May there, and, and obviously the image that you've chosen, which is called One Can't Look, or No Se Puede Mirar, is, is very much related to that kind of imagery, isn't it? Can you say more about it? Exactly. And that's one of the most interesting points about this uh, specific plate in the disasters of war, because we don't know much about the chronology of this uh, specific played when it was made. It was probably made around 1814. At the same time, he was painting the 2nd and 3rd of May, the two pendants that were made for the Royal Palace in Madrid. And uh, what is striking about that is obviously the scene is a firing squad shooting uh, civilians, unarmed civilians. Is that he uh, transferred this image that was probably adequate for a plate, for a, an, an etching, for close inspection, for an intimate viewing. He transferred that to a large scale, to a scale of the um, history painting, as it was called, uh, 
an official painting. And that might be one of the reasons why these paintings were not, didn't have much success, as it were. And they were rapidly removed and they were not seen until the mid 19th century when they were shown at the Prado Museum. Right. One of the things that's really striking to me about this work is that the majority of the print is taken up with the people suffering, but then there's the menacing bayonets at the right of the image, which are which it's, it's difficult to to say how brilliant this is as a, as a, as a compositional uh, device. But perhaps you can have a go. But it's, it's an extraordinary piece of of image making, isn't it? I think it's one of the greatest moments in the history of Western art, actually. And he repeats that strategy in another plate of this series. And, and you're right, this is a choreography of emotions, people suffering, and each individual is carefully represented how he is or she is reacting to the fear of the moments before he or she is dying. And then you see this impersonal machine of war, headless machine of war, this row of bayonets. And uh, what is more striking about the, this composition is that this seems to be like a slice of reality. The time has frozen, but also the space is cut in half, which means this is not an artistic um, reconstruction, like a free composition. This is reality. We are getting only a slice of reality, a fragment of reality. And Goya um, conveyed that idea by showing only the tips of the bayonets. Um, it's really striking to me how brilliant Goya is as a depictor of light, both in his paintings and in his prints. And it's something that really comes across in this because, you know, he's, he's so amazingly imaginative with how he uses light. And again, that's really, really palpable in this in this image, isn't it? It is, and I think uh, mostly because he uses light um, not also in a symbolic way, obviously the meaning associated to darkness, but also in a compositional way in terms of the light, the striking light, the contrast between dark and uh, the highlights in the figures, it's advancing the impact of the bullet. So it makes in the image way more dynamic. And also you see this arrow shape, uh, a space in the right area of the composition, which was made with a direct wash of acid. Uh, it looks like an arrow in a way, so it's pointing at the figures. We know that there's something coming from the right uh, side of the image, a very violent event, and the impact is going to be produced in a few seconds. And he made that only with the use of light. Yeah, can you say something about his materials? Because obviously he made these images during a time of war when materials were scarce, and there's a sort of roughness about this series. Is that right? Exactly, and they contribute to this idea of unfiltered reality. Uh, if you compare these plates to the Capriccio series, which were uh, very carefully composed, and the, he used like a very high quality aquatine, uh, the difference is striking, and it's another way, another symbolic way in which these uh, scenes reflect the circumstances of the, the war. And he used uh, lavis, which is a technique in which is a direct acid wash on the plate, which creates a very irregular um, biting, so the, the ink is not the deposit evenly on the surface and you can see here and there some tiny spots and blank areas that he burnish in a way but the surface is very rich the texture of the plate is very rich it's a very violent in a way execution so i think they add to this uh, idea to the 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 emotional intensity of the image by showing this vibrancy and textural richness can we picture the way that Goya would have made these images because of course when we think about printmaking today it's very often made with a master printer and the artist will be um, almost like a producer of the image and, and the technical side of it will be done by the master printer but was Goya working completely alone or did he have assistance when he was making them? We don't know much about that. We know the name of some people associated with, with Goya, especially for the Tauromachia series, Rafael Esteve and others. We don't know much about this specific project. Uh, who printed like the, the working proofs we have. Uh, we know that he had to use um, plates of different sizes. In four cases, he even had to cut in half a larger plate because he didn't have high quality plates available. 
he basically couldn't use um, um, high quality aquatin, so he used whatever he had in handy. Um, the the quality of the biotin is irregular. In some cases, you find uh, foul biotin and areas where the the acid was not correctly applied. So that's what we get from the images that he didn't have. Uh, he didn't produce them in one sitting, as it were, or he pro he created the drawings, preparatory drawings, most of which are at the Prada Museum, and then he would transfer the the images, the drawings, to the plate. Um, but he would make some changes sometimes, and then he would um, um, etch the main composition, and he would apply lavis, as it were, as I said, acid to the plate, and he would make some changes as he was trying the composition. We have working proofs that um, capture the image uh, changing from one phase of composition to the other, uh, but that's what we know. We don't have much information about the um, about the actual production of the disasters. Lastly, I, I mentioned earlier on that they've become so emblematic of inhumanity to a certain degree. Um, do you want to say something about the legacy of these prints and what they mean today and, and what they mean to other artists? They are the most universal statement against war and also about the, having a humanitarian attitude. If you think about the caption, one can't look. Uh, it's saying something very powerful. Um, it's not a description. It's not. The, it could be like a group of people in the interior of a cave being shot. It's not that. It's one can't look. And if you uh, you see the images, none of the figures is looking at the bayonets. We are looking. So the words, the mirar, no se puede mirar. One can look. The composition. It's inviting, as it were, the viewer to react, to react emotionally against that atrocity. So I think that's what makes the disasters of work a universal creation, because they are temporal. They are still meaningful to us, and we can't clearly relate to what we are seeing in the images. And that's what that's the main legacy of Goya. And as I said at the beginning, he is. For these reasons, uh, for the, because of the legacy of the disasters of war and the second and third painting, probably the first modern artist. Francisco, thank you so much for talking to us about this amazing work. Thank you. Goya's graphic imagination is at the Metropolitan Museum until the 2nd of May. The exhibition catalogue to which Francisco contributed is published by the Met and priced at $50 or $45 for Met members. And that's it for this episode. You can subscribe to The Art Newspaper at theartnewspaper.com, click on the subscribe link at the top left of the page and you'll find a range of subscriptions. And do subscribe to this podcast and our other podcast, A Brush With, if you haven't already done so. Please give us a rating or review if you've enjoyed it. You can find us on Twitter at Tan Audio and on Facebook and Instagram, of course. The Week in Art is produced by Julian Hausker, Amy Dawson and David Clack. And David is also the editor and sound designer. Thanks to Helen, Naomi and Oakwe, to Cara, Hannah and Laura, to Francisco and to you for listening. See you next week. Bye for now. The Week in Art is sponsored by Christie's. Visit christies.com to find out more about the world's leading auction house since 1766. Auction, private sales, online, art, anytime.